Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, take this opportunity on each occasion to welcome those who are joining us on our Heritage.org website, uh, those who are joining us via C-SPAN today and other networks in the future. Would remind everyone in-house, if you'll make that courtesy check to see that cell phones have been turned off, it is always appreciated by those recording the event. And we will, of course, post this program on our website for everyone's future reference in the near future. Our internet viewers are always welcome to send questions or comments simply emailing us at speaker at heritage.org. Hosting our discussion today is Cully Stimson, Senior Legal Fellow and Manager of the National Security Law Pro Program in our Catherine and Shelby Cullum Davis Center for International Studies. Mr. Stimson served as Heritage's Chief of Staff and previously in our Mies Center for Legal and Judicial Studies where he focused on national security, homeland security, crime control, and public policy. Prior to joining Heritage in 2007, he served as the second Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Detainee Affairs, serving both Secretaries of Defense Donald Rumsfeld and Robert Gates. He coordinated the Department of Defense's global detainee policies, including in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Guantanamo Bay. He also led the DOD delegation before the United Nations Committee Against Torture when the U.S. presented its second periodic report and took the first three European delegations to Guantanamo Bay. Before that, he served as an assistant U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia for almost five years. He has also been a local, state, and military prosecutor and defense attorney. He is an adjunct professor of law at George Mason University School of Law and served as vice president at Marsh McLennan here in the district. A 20-year veteran of the United States Navy JAG Corps, Mr. Stimson has served as a prosecutor, defense counsel, and is currently a commander and serves as the deputy chief trial judge and executive officer of the Navy Marine Corps Trial Judiciary. He is also the author of numerous scholarly articles and a book on the constitutionality of life sentences for juvenile killers. Please join me in welcoming my colleague, Cully Stimson. Cully? Thank you very much, John, and uh, I'd like to welcome each of you uh, to the Heritage Foundation and our second uh, event uh, in our new national security law uh, program. The goal of this new program is to research and discuss and debate the myriad tough legal and policy issues in the area of national security law. And since 9-11, there have been many issues, and terrorist detainee policy is certainly one of the toughest, or in my opinion, the toughest issue out there. My goal as the manager of the program is to bring thoughtful and experienced professionals together, regardless of political stripe or any party affiliation, to discuss and debate and articulate uh, these issues in a civil and apolitical manner. And that's why I'm particularly pleased uh, to have three friends and colleagues join me today on the stage. Each of us has had the privilege of serving in the same job. Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Detainee Policy, or DASD, DA, as it's called in the building. And each of us has had to tackle some tough challenges during our tenure in that job. Yet many of the issues that we confronted then and now are the same. And that is why I thought it would be interesting uh, for you to hear about the evolution of detainee policy, the law, the policies, the practice, and the realities of the experience from the four DASD DAs. I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge uh, at the outset the many thousands of uniformed military personnel who have worked with distinction in implementing detainee policies day in and day out. And I also want to acknowledge the career civil servants who have worked on behalf of the American people across two administrations to help shape detainee policy. Each of us on the stage today could not have done our jobs without their help. And one of those civil servants is a guy named Alan Liotta, who's not be able, able to join us today, who, by the way, was, was the acting DASD DA four separate times over the past nine years. And I'd also like to thank Francois Stam, the current head of delegation for the International Committee of the Red Cross, and his predecessors. On behalf of all of us, uh, let me just say that the confidential dialogue between the United States and the ICRC has been of vital importance. Thank you for coming today. Today's format is quite simple. 
uh, we'll hear from each panelist in the order in which they served. Each will give between seven and ten minutes of prepared or perhaps unprepared uh, but thoughtful comments. <laughs> and we'll start uh, with Professor Matt Waxman, then me, Sandy, and Bill Leitzow. The first DASD DA and our first speaker is Matt Waxman. Matt is a professor in law and faculty co-chair of the Roger Hertog Program on Law and National Security at the Columbia Law School in New York City. He's also an adjunct senior fellow for law and foreign policy at the Council on Foreign Relations and on the Hoover Institution's Task Force on National Security Law. He took his undergraduate and graduate degrees from Yale, was a Fulbright Scholar at King's College London, where he studied in the Department of War, and always the underachiever, clerked not only for Judge Flom on the Seventh Circuit, but also for the Associate Justice uh, of the Supreme Court, David Souter. Matt, I'm delighted you're here. Sandy Hodgkinson was the third DASD DA. She is Vice President and Chief of Staff at DRS Technologies, a mid-sized defense firm owned by Finn Mechanica. A former career civil servant in the United States government as a senior executive, her positions included, among others, distinguished visiting research fellow at the National Defense University, special assistant or chief of staff to the Deputy Secretary of Defense, William Lynn III, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Detainee Affairs, Deputy Ambassador at Large for War Crimes Issues at the State Department, and Director for International Justice on the National Security Council. She spent a year in Iraq advising the Coalition Provisional Authority on Human Rights and Justice Matters. She is author of more than 15 scholarly articles and serves on the Board of Directors for the International Law Students Association. She has been uh, teaching national security law at Catholic University's Law School since 2007. She earned her JD and Master's from the University of Denver and graduated with her bachelor's degree from Tulane. She is also currently a shipmate of mine, a commander in the Navy Judge Advocate General Corps, where last week she was selected to be captain. Congratulations, Sandy. Thank you for joining us today. The fifth and current DASD DA is Bill Leitzow, a career Marine Corps officer who retired as a full bird colonel. Bill took his undergraduate degree from the Naval Academy before he joined a component of the Navy, the Marine Corps. He took his law degree from Yale and has an LLM for the Army JAG School and an MS in National Security Law from the National War College. Before his appointment as DASD DA, Colonel Leitzow was Deputy Legal Advisor to the National Security Council. Bill has a long and distinguished resume, and among other things, he has held numerous posts as a Marine attorney, including as a prosecutor, defense counsel, and military judge. He has served on several U.S. delegations in multilateral treaty negotiations, and most relevant for today's event being the Rome Statute for an International Criminal Court. So as you can see, we have a very experienced, talented group of folks, and with Without further ado, I'll turn the stage over to the first DASDA, DA, Matt Waxman. And we'll just speak from our chairs. Great. Well, uh, thanks very much, Cully, and th uh, thank you all for being here. It's, uh, I'm excited for this event. We've been talking about it for a long time. And uh, let me just begin with a, a little history of the office and, and talk about what were some of the priority issues during my tenure, which was uh, about mid-2004 till late 2005. Uh, I'll also comment a bit on, I think, what we did well and where we didn't do well. Mid-2004, uh, uh, for those of you who have been following this issue, I, I may ring a bell. This is right on the, the heels of the Abu Ghraib crisis. Um, so I, I think it was in around April 2004 that the issue uh, I, I sort of splashes in the public, uh, public sphere, in newspapers, television, et cetera. And uh, I, with some urgency, the Pentagon decided to establish an office of uh, 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 to to handle detainee affairs, to handle detainee policy, I I, I mention that to to start for for two reasons. Um, one is to emphasize the point that there wasn't really. Uh, until 2004, an office within the Pentagon, uh, especially within the uh, Undersecretary of uh, uh, Undersecretary for Policy, with sole responsibility for detention issues, detention, detainee affairs, detainee policy, et cetera. And I think part of the reason for that was that until uh, uh, the September 2001 attacks, there wasn't really so much of a thing of of 
detention policy. Um, the detention policy was the Geneva Conventions. Uh, that's not to say that, it, that that difficult policy dilemmas didn't come up in prior wars, um, but it was mostly about uh, uh, implementing uh, 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 the Geneva Conventions and long-established doctrine for how you run detention facilities and and and, and, and so forth. Uh, uh, after uh, uh, 2001, uh, we had a range of very difficult policy issues that came up, uh, uh, not just with regard to care and custody, but transfer of detainees. Uh, I, I, many of our, our, our detention programs also had an intelligence gathering component to them. We needed to coordinate the detention and intelli intelligence piece. There were coalition aspects to, 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 to all of this. Um, so we had a lot of policy issues that we needed to, to go through, to, 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 uh, uh, to work through. I'd also say that before this office was created, uh, uh, detainee policy was 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 being conducted. It was being conducted, though, uh, and advised sort of throughout a, a number of different institutions within the uh, with, within the Pentagon. So uh, I, uh, the people who were thinking about. Uh, detention policy for Guantanamo were not necessarily the same group of people who were thinking about detention policy in Afghanistan, Iraq, elsewhere. And so uh, uh, the idea behind, uh, uh, one of the ideas behind the creation of the Office of Detainee Affairs was to consolidate this organizationally. In terms of our priorities, though, uh, uh, there was one, uh, we, we, had, we had a lot of difficult uh, uh, policy issues that we needed to confront from the beginning. The overwhelming priority was uh, uh, to deal with uh, detainee mistreatment. So this came, like I say, in the wake of the Abu Ghraib crisis. Uh, uh, investigations into that, as well as reviews of our detention programs in Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, 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 Guantanamo, re revealed uh, uh, widespread uh, problems, mistreatment, abuse, uh, uh, mismanagement, et cetera. And, and uh, like I say, the biggest uh, uh, the biggest single priority in that early stage of this office was uh, uh, to improve the care and custody of our, our, our detainees and ensure that we minimize the likelihood of uh, a future misuse, a uh, 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 future abuse, uh, mistreatment. And let me say, I, 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 that's something that I think the office, and, and not just the office, because this was a Pentagon-wide effort, uh, I think uh, uh, was a big success during that period. We had a lot of lessons learned that were uh, uh, brought to the surface through uh, uh, internal Pentagon reviews, external reviews, working with uh, uh, our partners, the ICRC, to, uh, 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 to surface issues, uh, uh, and working with the combatant commands, the, the, the military services, the various components of the Pentagon. I think we did uh, a, a very, very strong job in bringing up the quality of detention uh, uh, detention operations and ensuring that uh, we minimize the likelihood of future Abu Ghraib type uh, type issues. There is one aspect of that care and custody, the detainee treatment issue that we weren't able to uh, to solve. This was uh, something that was uh, frustrating to me personally, uh, um, uh, but uh, I think one of the problems that in my mind was surfaced by uh, these reviews of what had gone wrong in the early years of detainee operations was a failure uh, uh, to use international standards as our minimize as our minimum treatment standards these include uh, uh, prohibitions on cruel and human and or degrading treatment as found in the, the the convention against torture and the minimum treatment standards of common article 3 of the Geneva conventions uh, uh, there were a lot of, of internal and interagency discussions of whether these ought to be uh, uh, laid out as uh, uh, as as uh, 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 irreducible floors in the end uh, I, I, I I, I, other branches of government ended up intervening. So Congress in 2005 passes the Detainee Treatment Act, imposing, uh, uh, making clear that uh, uh, U.S. government-wide uh, uh, cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment was uh, a minimum treatment standard. Then, then in 2006, the Supreme Court declares that Common Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions uh, uh, apply in the uh, conflict against al-Qaeda. So that helps to solve these problems. But I think uh, uh, due to some policy disagreements, legal disagreements, political disagreements, that was one 
aspect of the um, uh, of our process of reforming detention operations that we weren't able to get done internally within the Defense Department during that 2004-2005 time frame. In terms of uh, just re real quickly some other uh, uh, issues that we uh, 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 that we worked on that were that were uh, priorities. I, I I I think these were high priority issues, but none of them approaching the uh, the high high priority of dealing with uh, detainee treatment issues during those first few years. One of them was uh, I, I, uh, putting in place and institutionalizing good review processes at Guantanamo. So uh, the time that I uh, stepped in in, in mid-2004, this also follows on the heels of two Supreme Court decisions, that, that the cases of Rasul and Hamdi. As a result uh, uh, of those, well, actually, uh, uh, there were already plans within the Pentagon to uh, uh, put in place a periodic review process to review uh, uh, in, a, in, in a regularized way the, the detentions of remaining Guantanamo detainees to determine whether they should still be detained at Guantanamo or released or transferred uh, 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 to another country. Uh, uh, those Supreme Court decisions accelerated uh, 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 and, and led to some changes in the way that those uh, processes were, were organized. Uh, I think some aspects of this were uh, uh, were successful. Some aspects of, aspects of it were were, were less successful. I, I, I would say that, for example, the combatant status review tribunals, uh, 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 which were which were something we were not uh, uh, accustomed to conducting in these types of environments. I think, uh, uh, despite the the best of intentions and and very very hard good faith efforts uh, uh, by those tasked with with running them, I think we're probably not. As, as, as well designed as, as, as they should have been for uh, reviewing enemy combatant status at, at Guantanamo. On the other hand, we had a review process, an annual review process to determine even for, for even those who should be or who legally could be detained at Guantanamo, should they be detained there or should they be transferred home or to a, a, a third country? I think we had a, a we, we developed a, a robust process that led to the transfer or releases of hundreds of detainees uh, 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 during this period uh, or, or, or approval of, of, of the the transfer or release of, of hundreds of detainees. And let me make a, a point that I think is relevant here to, uh, uh, to current policy discussions about this. Uh, uh, most of those transfers uh, during my tenure from Guantanamo to home countries or to third countries were done so with the understanding that there was some risk that the individual would uh, 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 return to the fight would engage in some dangerous, uh, 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 even terroristic activity. These were not transfers where we had a hundred percent guarantee that uh, uh, there would be no. It's often now referred to as as, as recidivism. These were done eye open to the fact that there was some risk. Uh, uh, the the policy view was that that risk was a risk we should be willing to bear because there are counter risks on the other side. There are counter risks from a humanitarian or liberty perspective. There are resource issues. There are partnerships that we're trying to cultivate with, uh, with, 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 with uh, uh, other uh, uh, coalition countries, et cetera. Uh, uh, and I think uh, uh, we have, as, as I look at the Guantanamo debate today, I think we have boxed ourselves in politically if we think that that the only condition under which we can afford to release somebody is if we can somehow guarantee zero probability of any risk of, of danger. Uh, I, I, that certainly was not the standard that we were applying when we uh, transferred or released hundreds of detainees from Guantanamo during 2004-2005. Uh, I'll just end by saying another priority issue was transitioning detention operations, especially in Iraq and Afghanistan. I, I, I think my colleagues will probably talk more about that because uh, I think the bulk of the of the hard work came during their tenure. Uh, uh, this was a, a, an, an immense challenge and I'll just mention that it's often th these days uh, I, it, 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 it often appears in the press in the context of transitioning detention operations from uh, 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 from the United States to uh, uh, the government of Afghanistan uh, 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 and it's often mentioned that uh, uh, it's taken 
uh, it's, it's already been two or three years uh, uh, since the Obama administration struck a, 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 an arrangement with the Karzai government for how to do this. Actually, it goes back much further than that. There was a, a prior agreement in late 2005 uh, uh, to transfer detention operations, uh, uh, and many of the same issues uh, that are, I think are currently being worked through now were surfaced then. Uh, so it's really been about eight years that we've been trying uh, uh, to work through this very, very dif difficult uh, 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 set of moves with the government of Afghanistan for how to transition detention operations from the U.S. government to the government of Afghanistan. Well, thanks, Matt, um, for setting the stage here, because I think it's important that folks realize that the office was a new office in the Pentagon, um, and it was a necessary uh, improvement in terms of Focusing our energies on in one place uh, across all of DOD on detention operations. Um, Matt uh, leaves uh, the Pentagon, goes across the river to the State Department. Alan Liotta was the acting DASD for a few months, and then I came uh, uh, to the Pentagon after uh, nine separate interviews over two months. One of the persons I interviewed is actually right here, um, and. Um, one of the main things that, that uh, was still left to be done uh, was, of course, uh, what Matt alluded to, and that is you know, uh, establishing a floor uh, for the baseline standard of care and treatment for all detainees, regardless of their legal status. Uh, there had been a previous uh, DOD instruction. The DOD's instructions are sort of the top law for all DOD components uh, out there. It was a 1994 instruction dealing with uh, enemy prisoners of war and other folks caught up in wartime, but it had not been updated since 9-11. And so this instruction, 2310.01e, uh, which uh, Matt worked very hard on uh, within the interagency and DOD to, to, to incorporate some of these things he's talking about, uh, still hadn't been done. And it was very clear to me when I came on board uh, in talking with not only um, people within the Pentagon, but outside people, uh, that um, something big would have to happen before we could actually uh, incorporate, among other things, Common Article Three of the Geneva Conventions verbatim within the DOD instruction. Well, that big thing uh, ultimately ended up being the Hamdan decision in, by the Supreme Court in, in 2006 at the end of June. And I want to talk about 2310, the Army Field Manual, Hamdan, and a few of the other big things that happened uh, during my tenure. Matt um, is a humble guy, and he didn't uh, take credit for this, but I will, I will say that, you know, Matt worked very hard with people at the Pentagon and within the government to craft uh, agreements with not only the government of Afghanistan, but Saudi Arabia, because the big three populations at Guantanamo were the Saudis, the Afghans, and the Yemenis, and that is to, uh, as he said, engage in thoughtful, not risk-free, uh, but thoughtful transfers of those detainees that the executive branch believed should be transferred. Uh, back to the governments of uh, Afghanistan and, and Saudi Arabia, and that process was ongoing uh, when I came uh, to the Pentagon. But the um, I think Matt picks up on another point I think is worth highlighting for a moment, and that is, you know, Matt said it wasn't as if detainee policy wasn't happening when he got to the to the to the job. Of course, it was happening. One of the uh, first persons in the field, uh, lawyers in the field, was a Marine major uh, who was in Afghanistan and in charge of uh, the legal side of, of what standards of care and treatment apply as we started bringing t people together uh, uh, in, in Afghanistan. And his response was, well, we need to treat them consistent with the Geneva Conventions. That's what I'm trained to, and that's the way we should, we should treat uh, detainees. Um, among other things, uh, Another outstanding piece of work that still needed to be done was the Army Field Manual on Interrogations, uh, which there had been previous versions of it, but the one that we ultimately published after the Hamdan decision was, was this one. It's FM2 TAC 22.3, which is the official title is Human Intelligence Collector Operations. But the debate within the administration and DOD was what, if any, uh, what techniques should be authorized and should there be a classified annex to that particular document? And it took on more significance because, as Matt said, the Detainee Treatment Act, the uh, McCain Amendment, passed at the end of 2005. And among other things, it said that 
only those techniques authorized in the Army Field Manual uh, may be used uh, uh, for DOD uh, detainees or those in the effective control of DOD. And so it took on added significance as we uh, debated and, and discussed and, and worked through the hard issues of what techniques should be authorized and whether there should be a classified annex. And ultimately, we decided there shouldn't be a classified annex because it didn't serve, among other things, the needs for transparency. One of the processes Matt was involved in uh, uh, was uh, the DSLOC, the Defense Senior Leadership Oversight, Oversight Committee. Uh, for those of you who remember, there were 12 major investigations uh, after the Abu Ghraib uh, scandal. Uh, those 12 major investigations put in place or made 492 specific recommendations. And uh, in the Pentagon, we do, do a good job with numbers and implementing things. And so we laboriously and methodically worked through and tried to implement all 492 of those recommendations um, from those 12 major investigations. And that the way the, the forcing function to do that was this uh, DSLOC, which I was the co-chair of, Matt uh, preceded me in, in that. And we ultimately implemented 486 of those 492 recommendations by the fall of 2006 when we published uh, the DOD uh, instruction and the Army Field Manual. And so I think that was uh, part of the, uh, the process of sort of making forward progress in, in, in fixing things. In May of 2006, when I was uh, there, the, the U.S. government uh, presented its second periodic report to the United Nations uh, Committee Against Torture, and I was part of the DOD delegation. Uh, I believe actually Matt and Sandy were there in their respective roles in the State Department. It was a very large delegation. John Bellinger led the U.S. delegation. And, you know, one of the things Matt talked about is uh, the number of people who were held accountable uh, during um, – for their mistreatment of detainees. And I went back and looked uh, at our um, report uh, to, to the rapporteurs in Geneva. And as of May of that year, um, 103 folks had been court-martialed for detainee abuse. 89 had been convicted. There were 100 – Folks subjected to non-judicial punishment, 60 had been reprimanded, another 28 had been separated. So the, the process of, of holding people accountable for their mistreatment was ongoing, and I, I know those numbers have gone up uh, since then. Um, after 9-11, uh, like many uh, people in the reserves, I was recalled uh, back to active duty, and um, I was sent to Jacksonville, Florida, to be a, a senior defense lawyer, and my, my uh, uh, colleague and buddy was uh, Charlie Swift. He was a lieutenant commander who ended up later being the chief military counsel for Salim Hamdan. So when I came to the Pentagon to work on detainee matters, Charlie was representing Hamdan. That's the first case that went before military commissions. And when I was at the Pentagon, uh, Hamdan's case was worth for the Supreme Court. So I remember like it was yesterday, the morning of the decision. Uh, I called Charlie very early in the morning because I knew it was his practice to uh, to walk his dog on those hot summer days uh, way before it got hot. And I told Charlie, I think, he, I think you're going to have a big day. Congratulations for, for what you did. And in fact, I saw the Hamdan decision uh, as an opportunity uh, to uh, jumpstart the issue of the, of the DOD instruction. And uh, in fact, our staff pulled together the latest version of 2310. And moments after the decision came down, we shipped it around to various uh, folks at DOD to try to get that jump started and pushed through and ultimately it was published uh, with Common Article 3 as Enclosure 3 in, in September of that year. Let me touch on two other things and then I'll turn it over to Sandy. Um, there was a debate, as, you, as many of you have read, uh, within the administration of uh, what to do or how to move forward uh, with uh, military commissions after the Hamdan decision came down and within DOD, uh, I was one of a small group of people who were advising the secretary, and as a former, as the only former federal prosecutor and military prosecutor in the room, I had a lot of respect for federal courts. I also had a lot of respect for military courts and commissions, uh, and and uh, ultimately the decision was taken to to start with the UCMJ and work backwards under using the doctor of impracticability to peel back those rules that are impracticable for wartime uh, commissions cases. And, uh, of course, there's been an update to the Military Commissions Act. The 2009 Act updated some rules, and I think wisely so. Um, but that was – that took up a lot of our fall. 
a lot of things happened on September 6. You had a confluence of events. Um, you had us on one day publishing the DOD instruction, pub republishing the Army Field Manual on Interrogation, sending the Military Commissions Act uh, uh, language up to the Hill, and then the President uh, announced that uh, 14 high value detainees who were previously in CIA custody were, were brought to CIA, brought to uh, Guantanamo. Uh, and, and uh, uh, of course, in the position I was in, I was involved in all of those uh, events. Um, I think the last thing I would say is, uh, this may come as a surprise to some of you, but Secretary Rumsfeld very, felt very strongly uh, about the need for more transparency uh, at Guantanamo in our detention operations there. And so he uh, ordered me early on uh, in my tenure to take as many people to Guantanamo as possible, congressmen, senators, um, the press, et cetera, and go on the record. Uh, I know Sandy was on a couple of those trips. Other people were on those trips. Uh, and, and just take people there and let them make their, their own mind. Uh, and so part of that process, we were fortunate enough to take uh, the uh, first three European delegations to Guantanamo uh, Bay. And I think that, um, you know, to the extent practicable, we need to be as transparent as possible about what we do in detention operations. And I agree with Matt 100% uh, that, you know, as we uh, transferred uh, a few hundred folks off the island um, uh, during my tenure and as we actually ramped up operations in Iraq, in, in, in advance of the surge and work with the Karzai government on the tough issues there, um, to the extent we can, we have, we have to be uh, a transparent. And um, I also echo Matt's point that, you know, the current restrictions in place are, make it very difficult uh, for any Secretary of Defense to sign a piece of paper saying he certifies that it's in the national security interest of the United States to, to send somebody off the island. Uh, and it's a regrettable fact, and I hope that it changes. Um, but it was a busy time. Uh, it was a time when Congress changed hands at the end of 2006. Uh, and um, it made it all the more difficult because of that change. Um, but uh, I think we, we uh, got some good things done. And we learned from a lot of mistakes that had happened before. Sandy? OK, thank you. Uh, actually, I'm delighted to be here today. And um, thanks to the great work of my uh, predecessors, there wasn't a lot to do when I got into the position in 2007. That's kind of a joke. Um, there, uh, there, there have been a lot of tremendous work that have been done by a lot of people in this room and people throughout the government. Um, but one of the areas that was still a pretty big challenge was working through these transfer processes, which I think you've heard a little bit about. And I'll try not to be repetitive in the few remarks that I make today. Um, as far as transfers go, uh, we really did try to work with other countries to mitigate the risk and the threat that they that they posed. Um, it doesn't mean that you can, you know, ensure that they won't go back to the fight. No one has a crystal ball. But we did make every effort possible to work with governments on those reasonable types of measures that would help them monitor the activities of someone once they return to their country or to ensure that they were somehow in some other way, whether they were going to be, you know, prosecuted for crimes they may have committed there previously. In some way, we could feel relatively confident that these particular individuals, if they went back to their home countries, would not pose a significant threat to the United States. As Matt said clearly, it was never risk-free, um, but it did take a lot of effort from people throughout the government, from all the agencies working together on these teams, to try to find ways to get more people from Guantanamo Bay home. And why are we doing this? I mean, you know, the, the elephant in the room is the fact that Guantanamo was then and remains today unpopular. Um, it was unpopular with our allies. It was unpopular even at home, uh, to a lesser degree at home now, I would say. But certainly with our allies, it's, it's always been unpopular. And so, you know, when we were trying to work with them on sending home their detainees, it was partly to appease requests that they've made. It was partly because we felt that it was important to continue to move Guantanamo into the best place possible. So we did that through transfers of people who we believed we could mitigate their risk. But we also did it through the continued progression on um, the treatment standards that both Matt and Cully have talked about and trying to find continued ways as the period of detention continued to make that better. Um, so things that we did during the time I was there, or at least enhanced while I was there, um, were these efforts to try to get more contact with families. So for people who had been detained over a large period of time, how could we ensure their families at home that 
you know, they were, they were healthy, that they were safe, that they were alive, and that they were communicating. I mean, there had been letters back and forth, but we increased efforts to create better family visits in, very, in a variety of places and in the places where we couldn't immediately have family visits. We tried to increase the ability, you know, to see one another, whether through a video teleconference or through a photo or some other way. Um, and that was sort of the continued progression of trying to enhance the protections that we provided to people that we were detaining during the time period. Um, a lot of other things that happened during that time, and I'll talk for a minute about Iraq and Afghanistan, because that is where I think we had some significant changes during the two years that I was in the position, um, is we, we, we took some great suggestions that had come from the field, from particularly a, a wonderful uh, Marine general known as General Stone, for those of you who've encountered him. Um, he, he had some strong proposals that we took very seriously in Washington, ultimately implemented, which were taking what had previously been just detention facilities and turning them into his concept of the TIFRIC. So it was a theater internment facility, but it was a rehabilitation and integration center. And the idea was we had so many people we were detaining at Camp Buka, in particular in Iraq, that the detainee population had swelled. The bigger the population, the less manageable it is, the more security threats that we had to deal with inside the wire, not just outside the wire. And the idea of trying to work through rehabilitation programs and integration um, for when they were to be released ultimately from detention was a new concept for the recent conflicts, but not one that's unprecedented under law of war detention. Um, and we looked at ways of productively using their time inside the wire. And so ultimately, not everyone is convinced that people who were previously predisposed to fight us would somehow change through these programs. Some people believed it, others didn't. Um, but I think everybody believed that at least while they were in detention, they were most productively spending their days doing things other than wanting to fight one another or wanting to fight us. And then ultimately, at the end of the day, as I think most people generally agree, the better you tend to treat people while you're holding them, the more likely it is at the end that they're going to be predisposed to like you again. If, the, if that's going to happen, that's the better scenario. Um, so we spent a lot of time in Iraq and Afghanistan focusing on these sort of rehabilitative and, um, and integrative uh, types of activities. That would be we had some work job work programs where they could earn some money and, and try to buy things for their family and try to do some nice things for their family during the family visits. Um, we also looked at different opportunities for them to reintegrate better at the end, trying to get partners in the local communities that at least upon ultimate release would be there to somewhat be someone they could talk to and someone that would help them reintegrate into their local area with a job or some other type of program. Um, so while certainly never foolproof any more than a detainee transfer is, these were other things that we tried to put in place with the ultimate goal of ensuring that the people that were released from our custody at some point would be released and would be best positioned to integrate back into a normal enough life following the, the period of activities. Um, and I'm talking about this a little bit because as we look forward to the future here, I mean, we are really talking about law of war detention. And, and while people may characterize it in a variety of different ways, law of war detention has never been designed to be indefinite detention. It has always been designed to be temporal detention that occurs during a period of hostilities and that when that period of hostilities ends, the individuals are in fact released, repatriated. Um, and so keeping an eye towards that future state and what state an individual is going to be in at that point is something that is important to just hold in the policies that we have as we move forward. Um, and so, so continuing with a couple of these, these thoughts, um, you know, as we look to a future here, um, for whatever Guantanamo may be, some of the lessons we had in Iraq and Afghanistan may actually be helpful as we do that. I mean, Iraq, we did have more than 25,000 people in detention, um, and, and two years later had brought it down to zero. And there were some very, very high threat individuals that we held there in, in Iraq, and we did the best we could to work with the local authorities to find ways to ultimately integrate them in. Some of them probably do continue to pose a threat, and so it is certainly no, no you know, ideal notion that everybody suddenly was you know, harmless uh, upon release, but it's part of the process of moving from a period of, of hostilities into a period of ultimate peace and where the rule of law in the host nation and their own criminal justice system can begin to take on the, the, the threat in the future. Um, 
so I think, you know, as we look in Guantanamo Bay to what the future there will be, we obviously do need to remember that it's not indefinite detention. At some point, the hostilities will end. And, uh, you know, a series of different, you know, uh, commentators have made projections of what might be the characteristics of a different state uh, of the conflict. Um, but when it ends, the detainees have to be released. And, and I am absolutely certain that some of them will continue to pose a threat to the United States at that time. And so how can we best position these individuals and best position with a series of laws and working arrangements with our allies and others to ensure that at that time they pose the least amount of risk to us as possible. Um, one other thing I'll comment on as far as, you know, what we were doing during that time besides focusing on the reintegration programs and the transfers was also continuing the trend in working closer with our allies because as much as we have been traditionally the police force for the world at different times, the reality is we can't be that for here and into the future and not with the kinds of threats we face today and will continue to face. And so we spent a lot of time working with both traditional allies and non-traditional allies on strengthening their own rules and laws so that they can better handle these threats in the future, strengthening the cooperative arrangements we had through NATO and through other organizations to try in the future to work closer and better on some of these detention issues. Um, and, and it wasn't an easy path to take, considering we were coming from a position of being criticized, and they weren't. So we had to work together as best we could to try to share ideas and get to a more common ground. And I think the government, and they've continued that through Bill's time, and I honestly think we are in a better place as far as all that goes. Um, so the last thing I would just mention, uh, I've talked a little bit about, you know, the end of the conflict and what we would have to do. But as far as, you know, how do we in the future maybe not get to the same place that we got to over some of the past 10 years? And, you know, I certainly would recommend consideration of holding people closer to the battlefield in the future based on the experience that we've had. Uh, the farther you remove them from the place they are picked up, I would argue the more difficult it has become to return them at the end and to keep them close enough to their families for family visits and all the other types of things. So, you know, detention closer to the battlefield would be something to keep in mind for the future. Um, and, you know, at, at the end of, you know, this conflict, I think we're going to have to look long and hard at, at the release process and the transfer process and make sure that we feel that this is the place that we'd hope to get to by the end. Um, certainly, I know that Bill, Bill will have some great comments about where we are today and the latest thinking on all of that. Um, so I'll turn it over to Bill. Well, thank you, Sandy, and, and thanks for inviting me here. Uh, Cully and I, um, I, I don't know how to begin. Usually at panels where you're talking about detention, and I know everyone here has been on those panels, and we haven't been with each other. Uh, and so you usually are at one end of a spectrum. And how I begin is I say, I'm the guy who's cleaning up the mess that was created by my predecessors. <laughs> and, and I can't do that as well today. And, and seriously, I can't do it because, frankly, it, it has even been educational for me as I've seen how far we've come. And I do reflect on that a lot in a kind of a big picture way. Uh, listening to, to Cully, Matt, and, and Sandy, it, it really does remind me again. And, and we really are building on on something. It's also nice to be with people who understand that there's a complexity here that doesn't usually find its way into the kind of pithy one-liners you might read in the press when, when associating, uh, you know, with the word Guantanamo or, or detention in general. Um, what I'd like to do, I think, is kind of summarize uh, where we are and I think where we're going. Uh, and, and it really does follow nicely on, on where we've been. I think if you look at this administration in 2009, uh, President Obama began kind of a dual course um, in addressing the issues we've just been discussing. On the one hand, he announced his desire to close Guantanamo. And on another hand, he, he uh, talked about, uh, through a series of executive orders and directives, he pushed us toward a more principled uh, set of detention policies. Now, We've been notoriously unsuccessful at closing Guantanamo, and everyone here is familiar with the various uh, political machinations that have confounded uh, that goal. But I think, as was discussed by all my predecessors on this panel, pushing on 
and, and in adding to the paths that they started, I think we have been very successful in developing more principled, credible, and sustainable detention policies. Now, make no mistake, the President is absolutely committed to closing Guantanamo. We're also absolutely committed to transferring those detainees who threat, whose threat can be mitigated by some other means. Um, but I want to make something clear, again, in kind of summarizing where the United States is on detention policies right now. We're not committed to those transfers because the detainees somehow deserve to be released. Transfer is a function of our own national security interests. And any principal detention regime must involve the discretion to transfer if there's an alternative means to, to mitigate the threat. And I think all of my predecessors have agreed with that. Uh, that said, we're at war with Al-Qaeda and its associated forces. And throughout history, armies have captured and detained enemy forces in war. We do, we do not capture them in order to prosecute them and bring them to justice. We capture them in order to, to mitigate the threat they would pose on the battlefield while hostilities continue. Um, now, again, that said, this being a war, this is a different type of war than one we've had in the past. Um, one, I think it's harder to identify the enemy, and I think all of our, uh, all of my predecessors have had to grapple with that. Number two, it's harder to identify when hostilities have reached their conclusion. There's not going to be a treaty signed on the deck of the Missouri. Uh, one, it's in mothballs, but th there won't be any ship that will probably have a treaty that will make a clear ending to this conflict. And then finally, because we have dealt with terrorism using a law enforcement paradigm for so long and in so many occasions, uh, there's naturally a, um, um, a, a confusing of the two uh, legal regimes as they, as they kind of reach a confluence. Th that attending war, and the law of war, and that attending uh, criminal law enforcement. Um, and then moreover, uh, kind of on top of those three issues that make this war different, I think it, it may be associated with the fact that it's different, there's a, a paucity of legal guidance for this particular type of conflict with unprivileged belligerents in a non-international armed conflict. Um, how we treat unprivileged belligerents, how we deal with uh, their continuing detention, how we deal with the end of war in, in a place where we don't have a body of law recently negotiated. I mean, the Geneva Conventions and their protocols are the last major development in, in the law of war, and that was with respect to international armed conflict. Now, I believe that we actually have come, made great strides in developing our policies, and you've just heard about some of the details of how we made those strides. Uh, and I think those strides have put the United States in a position of leadership at where it should be in how you hold uh, people with respect to the developing law of war. Um, we've developed interrogation practices, as you've heard, uh, that are principled. We have detention policies that adhere to the highest standards. I don't think anyone could visit any of our detention camps and, and say that that's not an appropriate way to detain people under the law of war. Um, we've identified gaps in law and policy, and we've started filling these gaps. You heard Matt talk about combatant status review tribunals. I think the tribunals or the, the uh, boards that we now hold in Guantanamo, the detainee review boards, often cited, okay, maybe by me, as the gold standard, but by, but by other people as well, and they're not just uh, mimicking me. You know, right now, if a, if a combatant is captured in Afghanistan, commanding officer is making a decision right away, within 24 hours, as to whether we've got the right person and they need to be held. Within 60 days, they're going to go before a board of three field grade officers with the assistance of a, an officer who can help them, the detainee, present a case, and a decision will be made as to whether, in fact, we do have the right person and whether, in fact, their threat is so significant that we need to continue holding them and we can't mitigate it some other way. And then every six months thereafter, we hold a board to determine uh, whether or not that person should continue to be held under the law of war. And in the long run, if, if somebody were to work their way to Guantanamo years later, you're going to have full access to U.S. courts, which every detainee in Guantanamo has had, 
and you're going to have uh, a, an ability to again have your detention assessed as to whether the threat is such that you, continue, you need to continue to be held, even if under the law of war um, you legally can be held. I think, um, unfortunately, Guantanamo is never going to be a term that's associated with the best practices in detention. Uh, that's not our goal uh, at this point in time. Um, but I do believe the United States currently leads the world in detention best practices, honestly. Um, this past year, a number of countries got together and uh, put, uh, and, and, um, put down a, a, on paper a set of best practices uh, under the, called the Principles and Guidelines for Detention uh, in, international, uh, in International Military Operations. It's, part of the, it's called the Copenhagen Process that led to that document. And if you look at that document, you'll see that it describes U.S. detention practices. And frankly, it's only the United States right now that is, in fact, uh, engaging in those practices that are in complete compliance with that international standard. As um, Cully began, he described detention, I think you said, in your opinion, the, the, the most uh, difficult issue, or, or certainly one of them that this war has uh, wrought. I think in 9-11, uh, none of us, I certainly would not have identified detention as the issue that would divide Americans from each other, or certainly divide Americans from our allies. But in many ways, it has become that. Um, perhaps because of some early missteps, but I think more profoundly because uh, this is a new type of war. And, you know, of course we have made mistakes, but in the end, I believe uh, we have made principled progress. You have uh, heard about it today, and I believe in doing that, the United States has played a leadership role in, in the safe and humane care and custody of detainees in wartime. So. Well, well folks, before we uh, get to Q&A, please give our panelists a warm uh, round of applause. Thank you. Uh, Bill, um, I want to open it up to Q&A, but I want to thank you in particular uh, for coming, and I want to thank the administration for allowing you to come, because I think, you know, as I stated at the outset, my um, goal with this program is to bring people from across the aisle, regardless of party affiliation, uh, to to Heritage, uh, to our National Security Law Program, to discuss these issues in a civil way, and I really appreciate your, your being here. Um, so uh, the rules are easy. Uh, please uh, state your name, your affiliation, and then actually ask a question uh, of one of the panelists. Um, and uh, if you want to direct it to all, great. If you want to direct it to one, go ahead. But uh, microphones will be coming around, so just raise your hand if you have a question. This lady right here, please. Camille Alhassani from Al Jazeera English Television. Uh, Mr. Lita, I wanted to ask you a, a couple of questions about the ongoing hunger strike at Guantanamo. Um, recently, um, the, the, there was a new, uh, a revised medical management of detainees on hunger strike uh, uh, documents um, created um, in March of this year. And I wondered, you know, why was that document revised from the, from the previous document? And also, why in this document does the JTF commander have to give permission for tube feeding of detainees on hunger strike when that person is not necessarily a medical doctor? Um, thanks. I, I'm not sure exactly what revision you're talking about, but I am familiar with our, our uh, policies with respect to uh, hunger striking and enteral feeding, as you know, uh, throughout our detention camps, Iraq, Afghanistan, and and, and I, I failed to mention uh, uh, some of the things Sandy left off with on, on Iraq and Afghanistan, because as you know, historically, they've, we've kind of reached the denouement of those, um, the, the detention uh, piece of those conflicts. Um, but we've, we've dealt with hunger strikes uh, throughout the history of detention. Uh, and always, it's the commanding officer's decision as to when uh, someone should be enterally fed, and he always does it based on the medical advice that's given to him. In each case, based on body weight, blood sugar levels, uh, the detainee's own statements, there's a medical assessment done as to whether the person's health could be put at risk uh, by, a, by not 
enterally feeding them, and then that decision is made by the commanding officer based on the medical advice. And, and I will say as an historical uh, perspective, um, the secretary back in 2006 uh, stated that uh, we should take a wholesale review of the policies and practices of uh, providing nourishment uh, to those who want to politically protest through the vehicle of hunger striking. And so uh, we assembled a team of um, critics and supporters and essentially experts, medical ethicists, doctors, nurses, uh, and took them to Guantanamo, let them not only view uh, one of the uh, detainees while they were being nourished, uh, but also the protocols written and in practice. And that, uh, pr that um, trip was very helpful uh, to the government in terms of informing us. Uh, we were fully aware that the World Medical Association uh, does not agree uh, with that policy. Um, but, um, you know, that, uh, to Bill's point, is a, is a situation that was happening uh, when I got there. I'm sure it was happening during your tenure, Matt, and yours as well, Sandy, in terms of, of the hunger striking. Next question. Uh, the gentleman here in the front with the tie. Hi, uh, my name is Anil Vasanji. I'm a, a representative of one of the detainees in Guantanamo. This is a question for Mr. Litsa. Um, there, I know there are about 86 detainees who have been uh, designated for possible transfer, um, some of whom have been designated that way uh, multiple times. And uh, a number of the panelists have mentioned that in the past, we've negotiated with various countries like our, and our allies, um, Saudi Arabia, Afghanistan, and so on, to try and uh, transfer the detainees. Um, I was, my question is what is, um, I guess, why is the administration at this point in time not negotiating with some of our allies, such as Tunisia and Great Britain, who are trying to work with the administration to have the detainees transferred. Um, the law, the NDAA, which is often cited as um, a sticking point and um, is often, you know, finger pointing on both sides, but there are exceptions that have been put in place that allow the administration to waive uh, certain you know, blocking points and certify the detainees for transfer. Um, so I was wondering what precisely the administration is able to do or what the, why they're not doing it right now. Uh, thanks. First, first, I want to identify a very unhelpful trend of directing questions at me, which, <laughs> which I... The three of us are all for it, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, with respect to uh, the, the transfer process, though, as I, as I said, the administration is absolutely committed to transferring those who can be transferred uh, so long as the threat can be adequately mitigated. And, and as Matt and others suggested, that's certainly not a zero-risk uh, uh, calculus. Now, that said, I don't know where you got the idea that we're unwilling to negotiate uh, with countries as to whether they can provide appropriate security assurances, appropriate humane treatment assurances for detainees that might want to be transferred. We are absolutely committed to that, involved in that regularly. Yes, the, uh, the NDAA and some of the transfer restrictions complicate matters a little bit, but, but in fact, we're well aware of the waiver process there and are continuing to work on finding appropriate countries uh, that can mitigate the risk of those detainees who can who are designated for transfer. Let, I use it too to uh, just clarify something because you frequently read in the press, um, unfortunately, I think cleared for release as describing uh, detainees. And I appreciate that you didn't use that term because it it does bring about some kind of confusion. Like the detainee is somehow not a threat to the United States, not a threat uh, as a terrorist, and therefore is just being wrongly held. As I said, they've all had access to U.S. courts, uh, can bring a case if they think they are being unlawfully held. And the question is, as a matter of discretion, can and should the United States transfer them if we can, in fact, negotiate appropriate security assurances? And we're trying to do that every day. Often, though, you, you run into a situation where, uh, you know, I began by saying we're at war with al-Qaeda and its associates. Not all countries are at war. Um, that was one of the complexities, uh, again, in the, in the Afghanistan turnover and the Iraq turnover. We're leaving behind a peaceful country. We're in a counterinsurgency where U.S. troops are on the ground because we're in an armed conflict. When we leave, we're hopefully leaving behind a country at peace 
ruled by uh, the, the, the law of peace, and law enforcement would be the reason you'd hold somebody. So, so that's, the, that's the shift that has to take place. Somebody gets captured in Afghanistan, when we turn them over to President Karzai, he's going to continue to hold them as a law enforcement matter. There may be a delta there, and that's going to happen with all those we transfer from Guantanamo, too. So it's, it's not as easy as someone might think to simply transfer them. I might add in here, too, picking up on a comment that Matt made, too, which is, I mean, the certification process has become more onerous. And, and in fairness to the process, it's a lot more difficult for somebody in the administration right now to make a certification for a transfer. And so that is an area where I think we want to continue to work as well as we can with members of Congress to find, you know, the right balance between how onerous the certification process is or how high the burden is on the administration to to, to look into that crystal ball and say that, you know, this particular detainee will not pose a threat, rather than in the likelihood of all circumstances based on our past experience, we believe we have appropriate assurances in place. And those are two different things, you know, because it's not a risk-free proposition. Uh, the lady in the back. Hi there, Lisa Garcia, Judicial Watch. Thanks so much for coming and being on the panel. So I've attended all the hearings for the last 17 months, and you mentioned something about transparency during the past administration, making sure that members of Congress could attend. It's been the case that there have always been many seats that are empty, and when I've tried to put congressional members and staffers in touch with the Office of Military Commissions so that they might avail themselves of those seats and see on the ground what's been happening in the last two years, uh, they've been flat out denied. I don't know if it's an attempt to use sequester, but they've been told that they have to make their own code with their own plane and not utilize those seats. Besides that, I wish you would address Gaith and how Obama is using perhaps, I don't know, just the idea of using federal courts skirting around Guantanamo Bay. Thanks. She didn't designate it toward me. Go ahead, the, Bill. <laughs> yeah. the, um, I, I, am, uh, I, I have to say I'm not familiar with the situation on, with respect to military commissions. Um, I believe that if a congressional member uh, uh, wants to go to a military commission, there are ways to do that. Um, and I have, this is the first I'm hearing that there's difficulty getting down there when in fact there's an availability to, with empty seats. Of course there's difficulty getting to Cuba. Uh, you know, I, I shouldn't say there's no difficulty whatsoever. You have to get an airplane that goes to Cuba. Uh, but that has been done many, many times, and, and uh, I think that uh, there's a great push for openness and transparency on the military commission side that I have seen. Realize that uh, the military commission offices, you know, you heard Cully talking about involvement in military commissions earlier. Actually, earlier in my career, I was involved in military commissions. Right now, that's a different office than the Office of Detainee Policy, so I may not have the exact specifics on, on what the process is for getting down there, but I'm not familiar with any, any holdup. Um, and I forgot the, the other Gates, Southern Oh, um, and, and, and all I can say is when a, uh, you know, when, when the law enforcement uh, paradigm seems like the best one to mitigate the threat of, a, of anyone who might be involved in the hostilities, we're going to use it. Um, you know, there's a full recognition that this is a very difficult fight. We have to use all of the uh, available instruments of power that the United States has to defeat uh, al-Qaeda and its associates, and, and certainly our courts are among them. Can I, can I just jump in and say, uh, you know, I, I, I think uh, the Obama administration is correct in using federal criminal justice as one among a variety of tools for mitigating the threat of, 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 of some terrorism suspects. It's often, I mean, e each time there's a terrorism prosecution, it, it seems to uh, uh, kick up debate again about whether uh, a criminal prosecution is, is, is somehow uh, uh, not sufficiently serious in engaging a war against al-Qaeda, I think that view is totally wrong. I think there's also a misperception often 
that during the Bush years, uh, uh, criminal prosecution was not also c considered a, an option. That's 100 percent wrong. During the, during the Bush administration, there were a number of federal prosecutions brought against terrorism threats, including those who were suspected of being actual hijackers on the 9-11 attacks. So, uh, uh, or, or bring down planes subsequently. So uh, I, I think I think it's a uh, uh, this is actually uh, uh, something that both administrations have gotten right, which is that the uh, uh, our, our federal criminal justice system is a very very powerful counterterrorism tool that ought to be in any president's arsenal. Yeah, and the, and the position we've taken at Heritage is exactly as Matt says, and as the as the former federal prosecutor, I obviously have immense respect for our federal courts. I mean, the issue, of course, dusted up again with the Boston bombing case, uh, with some people, even some legislators, suggesting he should go to military commissions. Well, Rule 202A of the Military Commissions Act clearly states it's subject to only aliens for their jurisdiction. So since he was a citizen, obviously he's not even subject to the jurisdiction, the narrow, limited, and appropriate jurisdiction of military commissions. And so, uh, I mean, it's, it's sort of surprising to me that some folks don't even realize uh, that only a certain narrow class of individuals uh, are actually even subject to the jurisdiction of military commissions, uh, and on the other side of the coin, that our federal courts are an invaluable tool. You want to be a all of the aboveer to give the executive the lawful tools and the flexibility to use the right tool in the right case. Last question. Uh, I think you are here next. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much. My name is Johanna Markind. I'm just here as a private citizen. I have a background in federal criminal law, and I'm familiar with tools that are used in, to civil, in civil prosecutions to measure recidivism rates. And I'm just curious uh, whether you can talk about uh, whether there are tools that are used to measure recidivism rates among this type of, of non-traditional belligerent. Um, and whether they're statistically validated, whether you can identify them, whether they're classified, and so on. I'll, I'll take a quick tr uh, try at this and see if anybody else wants to add something. I mean, to my knowledge, there's no actual measurable tool that specifically is designed to handle recidivism here. I mean, people in the earlier days would try to look at the percentages and say, how is this like or not like the parole process and people that, you know, previously commit crimes and get out and then whether they go back in a, in a criminal context. Um, obviously, the scale of threat may be different, and so there may be a different limit to what people think is a society is willing to take, too, as far as what those numbers go. Um, but I think there have been a lot of efforts, at least through, you know, the intel community and other studies to try to determine in a more predictable predictive way who were the more likely types of people or what kinds of, of, of activities do they engage in during captivity that helps you know whether that person is more or less likely to go back to the fight, as you would call it, you know, the, the sort of battlefield determination of recidivism. But I don't think there's a perfect science to it, and certainly, you know, if there were more studies on it, we might have might be able to predict better who are the individuals likely to go back to the fight and who aren't. Um, and that's what makes this such a complex area when you're dealing with real people's lives and wanting to hold the highest standards possible, but there are other lives that lie in the balance elsewhere. And so trying to find the perfect balance of who to transfer back, who to let go, and who to continue to hold has been very, very challenging. Just, just so that you're not uh, left, though, without Without all the data you may be looking at, if you're if you're looking into this, um, while I think Sandy's exactly right on the on how we would theoretically uh, determine a recidivism rate such that we might uh, have it inform a, tran a specific transfer, realize that the intelligence community does do regular reports mm -hmm. on the recidivism rate. We tend to call it re-engagement rate because remember mm -hmm. I'm, I'm pushing toward that law of war paradigm as as opposed to a criminal justice paradigm. But, uh, but a re-engagement rate, and they have attempted to come up with mm -hmm. uh, a set of uh, criteria for that, and, and they publish, I'm not sure how periodically, uh, but an unclassified summary of that report uh, does go to Congress periodically during the year. Well, folks, we've come to the witching hour, and we're going to have to bring this to a close, but once again, if you could please join me in thanking our panelists today for the excellent presentation. <laughs> we're adjourned.